All right, let's talk about industrial sugar. Um, we've discussed the refining process, um, which really didn't change all that much into the later 19th century. What did change is that the refineries um, grew larger and larger because the demand for sugar grew and grew. And as sugar got cheaper, people wanted more of it. So here we see one of the cauldrons. Um, this is uh, late 19th, or early 20th century. This is from Shane Candies. This was used for boiling sugar for confectionery. However, it's very similar to the cauldrons we saw in the Diderot plates in that this one has a spout on it for transferring um, hot boiled sugar mass into another uh, uh, cauldron or table. Uh, between 1850 and 1900, the number of employees at the sugar refineries in Philadelphia grew 500% um, from 300 up to over 1,500 workers. Um, many of the refineries had been located a few blocks in from the wharves. Essentially, the wharves took over, over the riverfront, and then the refineries were in buildings in Old City, in Northern Liberties, in Kensington, and in Southwark. However, moving hundreds or thousands of these hogsheads a week into the refineries, which often were vertical buildings. So they were refining on stacked floors, not on one floor. Um, meant a tremendous amount of effort for porters and cost to get the product in, to get it refined into loaf sugar, and then to get that loaf sugar back out, transport back down to the docks and loaded onto other ships for distribution um, around the United States or on the train cars, which were also uh, located on the riverfront um, to take to final port. So essentially, um, some of the companies after the Civil War decided they would just build the refineries directly on the riverfront. And that's what you'll see in these uh, lithographs. Uh, these two lithographs are from the Independent Seaport Museum collection really wonderful views of these refineries. This is uh, called uh, the Speckles uh, Refinery, and this was a West Coast uh, sugar firm that wanted a piece of the Eastern market. This is about 1870. You can see uh, the people are like specks, like little ants almost. And so you can just see um, the scale of this refinery in relationship to uh, the other uh, neighborhoods, surrounding neighborhoods of South Philadelphia. Uh, this was located on the southern um, part of the city, uh, Delaware Riverfront again. And you can see it's mainly sailing ships. Here is a uh, coal-fired steam vessel. And then, of course, the proliferation of smokestacks, which showed um, how successful they were, and that this was a major uh, industry. Uh, this plate, uh, very similar, and also uh, time period. This is the Harrison Havemeyer and Company, um, Franklin Sugar Refinery. Uh, by 1870, roughly when this plate uh, was printed, Harrison, Havemeyer and Company had the largest sugar trust in the world. Um, this refinery was huge and they had Franklin, the Franklin was the brand and of course referenced Benjamin Franklin, uh, largest sugar refinery in the world. And this was located roughly um, where the museum stands today, uh, slightly south. And here, it's kind of neat to get up close to this uh, plate. You can see the hogsheads of molasses being hoisted up onto uh, 
little dollies to get them onto the train. And this is Pennsylvania Railroad uh, taking uh, the um, finished sugar away, probably. And then some of these hogsheads were being put into uh, horse carts that were going into the refinery for processing. And these are the different uh, boiling rooms and buildings. Uh, none of this is existing today. Again, lots of smoke uh, showing how these sugar uh, refining plants, uh, how successful they were. This uh, drawing shows an extension and enlargement of the Franklin sugar plant, so the same plate we just looked at. This is owned by um, Eric and I, by our, uh, a friend of us sold, sold this plate to us. It really shows more modern ships, uh, tugboats and steamships, essentially doing the same thing. This is about uh, 1910 or 1920. And here, I think this is sort of a funny thing. Here you have like a, a modern yacht um, that's just kind of cruising by on the Delaware, uh, this huge industrial plant. Okay, a couple of other objects um, related to uh, the industrial sugar refining of the era we just spoke about. This is what's called a box hook. Uh, this is a, a mid 19th century hand wrought hook, and it was used for picking up crates. Uh, crates often were bound with uh, rope or jute, and so you, so you could pick up two giant crates, one in each hand with these box hooks. These were a common sight on the riverfront at the time. Uh, small bags of sugar that would have been sold at grocery stores. These are from the early 20th century. Again, the same brands, Quaker and Franklin. Um, cardboard boxes of 25 pound uh, quantities like this would have been packed into those large crates we saw at the beginning. This is quite a rare box. I've never seen another one. Um, that's in the Burley Brothers collection. And then over here, uh, we have a little box that would have been bought at home in a grocery store probably during World War II. On the top, it says, buy cane sugar, refined in the USA, help home industry. And of course, um, by this time, industrially processed uh, sugar cubes would have been fairly common. Uh, this little booklet shows the inside and docks of the Franklin Sugar Refinery here in the 1920s. All right, we wanted to contrast sugar in the 18th century with those really fancy and priceless um, silver sugar boxes we saw in the beginning with the variety of sugar bowls that you start to see during the industrial period of the 1870s all the way up through the modern era of World War II and beyond. Uh, sugar bowls at this point uh, become a, a household staple on your kitchen table. And there's a variety, most of these came from the Burley family. Um, this is called a master sugar bowl and that would have been for a a saloon or a restaurant and it has different compartments on the top for different kinds of sugar and then down below uh, those are probably for um, cube sugar or nuts uh, things at, in a bar room um, that the bartender might want to be able to access. There's uh, Pennsylvania German redware and uh, Lenware toll. That's a 
a turned wood and painted sugar bowl in the back there, uh, cut glass crystal, um, early American press glass here. Uh, we have uh, fancy porcelains from Germany and Japan in the pre-World War II era. Um, some more press glass that's milk glass. And then uh, 1880s uh, industrial produced glass here. And some other ceramic bowls on the top. Uh, the one that's funniest to me is this canister um, from the Art Deco era. At this point, sugar was so cheap and so common that you just pour it out. It takes no effort to add sugar to every dish. Um, some other uh, fancier uh, china and porcelain sugar bowls on the bottom there uh, from our family. So this just gives people the idea um, that there's such a range and sugar um, by World War I was a totally democratic process, uh, product available to everyone.